naturally going to introduce them. But uh, first of all, once again, a uh, hearty welcome and uh, to everybody, whoever is participating in this session, whoever is listening to this game, because uh, this, I must say that this pandemic has made this reality possible that even in a virtual media also, we are so keen to attend an academic lecture or academic session with such energy and such spirit that right from the primary session, we are crowding in, in such an, a beautiful number to attend to the beautiful academic minds unfolding their uh, thing and thought and etc. and reflections on matters relating to and pertaining to the pandemic and all, all its perspectives and such. So thank you uh, all once again. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, Professor Ranjita Chakraborty because she is already here with us and we are already lagging behind by five to ten minutes perhaps uh, in time. So we have to finish it in time. This session, this primary session, will naturally was supposed to uh, run on to 12 p.m. Uh, and perhaps I, uh, we will be uh, uh, able to finish this within 12 p.m. This, uh, uh, in this session, we have got two academicians, of course, uh, two professors, and they will be delivering their lectures. And there is, after their lectures, their consecutive lectures, there will be one interactive session. Now, I am in a little bit of doubt whether this interactive session should be truncated a little bit or not. Earlier, we picked this time to be something around, you know, 25 minutes or something like that. Maybe we, we shall not get that much of time. And after that, from 11.55 to 12 p.m., as you have already got the fixtures, there will be a vote of thanks given by Dr. Dibden Dibash Gupta, Assistant Professor, Head of the Department of Political Science, for the first reading of the monitor that uh, That is also our collaborating college, of course. So, our first lecture will be delivered by Professor Indita Chakraborty on pandemic and political trust in the Indian scenario. Professor Indita Chakraborty is an eminent scholar in political science and her interests naturally go beyond the realm of his stipulated uh, discipline and stipulated subject. This is needless to say, definitely, because anything in mind naturally collaborates and interacts with all kinds of interests, all kinds of perspectives in multidisciplinary ways nowadays. Pandemic is a huge issue, it's a global issue, and it is also breaking the uh, membrane of these uh, uh, distinctions between local and the global and our time, and our idea of time and territorialities all are being challenged in such a big way by this pandemic that I am sure these two lectures of the Gita Chakravarti and Sashwadi Chakravarti will cast enough light upon these territories, upon these issues, upon this journey from the epistemic to the on taking seeking our solution to recover from this trauma of this pandemic uh, in several ways of course they are analytical and they have that investigative mind which has been uh, was celebrated and which has been naturally honored for decades now in these areas of academic professor Ranjita Chakraborty is a professor teaching in the department of political science in University of North Bengal since the last 19 years. And in her brief intro, it is already being written over there, it is published, that she is currently the head of the department in the uh, Department of Political Science in North Bengal. Her areas of specialization are gender and politics, public administration and development. She has edited a book, Women's Empowerment and Gender Insecurity, a South Asian Perspective. This is the title, Women's Empowerment and Gender Insecurities, a South Asian Perspective. And this has been published on Levant Books from Kolkata uh, from 2009. Uh, in 2009, and published a number of articles in reputed journals. She has also attended and presented papers in numerous international and national conferences. She was involved as a researcher in numerous projects also. She has worked as a team member in a UN funded project on trafficking, child marriage, and dowry in West Bengal. The tenure of that project was from 2005 to 2006. And she has successfully guided PhD and MPhil dissertations of multiple students, and she is a vibrant scholar in this field, of course. 
going on there. Hot and healthy. She was also a facilitator for the EGC program and capacity building of women managers, uh, women managers in higher education. That is her brief info, academic info. And along with Professor Rangita Chakraborty, there is also the second uh, dignified lecturer of this station, Dr. Shudit Chakraborty. He, he is also a second business person. And Dr. Shudit Chakraborty is an associate professor and head in the Department of Economics. Anandit Chandra College, Jalpaiguri, this paper. He has been teaching in SE College, Jalpaiguri, since 2000, and prior to that, he was appointed as an assistant professor in Chikanta Mahavikara, Dubguri, Jalpaiguri. That is also a just course journey in Jalpaiguri, in that place. Since 1994, he was a former Fulbright visitor professor of the University of Minnesota in the USA in 2008. He was also a visiting fellow at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, a visiting scholar in the University of Ghent in Belgium, a visiting scholar at the University of Kartboish in Switzerland, a visiting professor at the University of North Dakota and Florida State University in the USA. He has also been an invited researcher at the University of Costa Rica and an invited scholar at the University of Oslo in Norway. Apart from such international expositions and attending a number of national and international conferences, he has written a number of books and published profusely uh, in different uh, prestigious journals of national and international level. His books, some of his books, of course, include, I just read out the title that it was been published to us, but Food Security and Child Labor, this is one. Poverty and Human Well-Being, this is the second one. Child Labor in Rural Context and Child Abuse and Exploitation. Exploitation. And the last one is uh, Rural Poverty and IRD. No, uh, there is no point in taking uh, or consuming more time in introducing them because they are themselves, or their papers will talk of the scholarship that they possess themselves. Uh, let us first switch over directly to Professor Vindita Chakraborty. I hope that Dr. Philip Chakraborty has already joined us or is going to join us within the next two or three minutes. We will start with definitely our first speaker, Professor Vindita Chakraborty, and she is going to deliver her lecture. I have to, let, me, let me repeat the title first once again. I'm already calling. Uh, her title of the paper is Pandemic and Political Trust by India Uh Thank you very much for listening to this, and I hope that uh, this is going to be an exhilarating lecture with academic incisiveness and conclusive, you know, conclusive agenda that she has to come to some kind of a point. Actually, this is basically the best feature of any academic country that has touched big issues like a pandemic which has come across already the fields of theory and practice in multiple and many and various ways. Thank you very much. And over to Professor Vindita Chakraborty. Welcome, ma'am. Please start your lecture. Ah, thank you, Dr. Roy. Uh, let me present the team first. Morning, Shudita. Participants are please requested to turn off their videos. Okay, I, I think uh, the resource person keep their videos on. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. 
I think uh, 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 the slide is visible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it's visible. Okay, fine. Thank you, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to address the first lecture of this session. And uh, I thank, from the bottom of my heart, the organizers for uh, actually introducing me in uh, such beautiful words. But uh, I do not know. Uh, because it is finally what I deliver that uh, whether I am able to keep up to it or not. But anyway, uh, I have actually uh, decided to speak on something that has been uh, bothering me. And I think it has bothered many of uh, the scholars, research scholars, as well as uh, thinking individuals, I would say, not necessarily research scholars, that uh, how do we look at the pandemic and the multiple questions that it is uh, kind of uh, throwing up. Now, uh, what I have seen, or rather we have seen, uh, if you have been uh, following the newspapers and the academic debates, you would find that there have been multiple questions posed regarding the role of the state, the economy, the social realities, that what kind of social distancing, are the social distancing actually impacting upon our social selves and the way we look at our relationships in a whole range of domains, both within the public lives and our private lives. And uh, another uh, interesting point is that the ruling uh, emotion that uh, seems to uh, rule everybody's mind are, is a kind of an anxiety. What next? We do not know what comes or what awaits us next morning when we go to sleep at night. We do not know uh, whether uh, the everything that we are sleeping with or we are seeing today, tonight, uh, may not be there next morning. So there is a kind of an anxiety everywhere in the minds. And um, probably also, uh, I try to look into the crisis of uh, democracy also, which we kind of, uh, we are also looking at things that is happening around us. And uh, not just uh, it's not necessarily inside our country, or but globally as well, that uh, there are certain uh, failures, certain collapse, certain fears, uh, fears uh, of uh, uh, debating, fears of getting into a discussion, and uh, regarding uh, uh, the various issues that are coming into existence. So basically, today I have decided to uh, look into uh, two major. Uh, Point. And uh, first of all, uh, to lay the background, <coughs> excuse me, to lay the background, uh, we have seen that there has been a uh, publication of numerous reports that is uh, looking at the state of democracy for the last 15 years. And uh, the reports indicate that there has been a gradual erosion and decay of uh, democracy. In fact, uh, a report uh, that I am uh, pointing out that is uh, in Varieties of Democracy, uh, Democracy Report 2020, it points out that there has been an increase of authoritarianism, autocratization, and uh, in fact, Hungary's Viktor Orban, uh, he used it as an issue to establish Europe's first corona dictatorship. Now, uh, when this is a situation, uh, I have tried to pinpoint my discussion, not uh, going around here and there, rather point on two things. That is, uh, what is political trust and what does the present trends indicate globally as well as uh, in the context of India? And secondly, is it going to be a permanent feature or the trends that we are observing, is it going to be a permanent feature or we are going to see something different once the pandemic subsides? Because we are all hopeful that this would pass on and a new morning would come. And so, uh, we expect that the pandemic would subside and thereafter what would be the direction of our polity what kind of uh, uh, issues would come up what kind of debates would come up what kind of discussions would come up so basically focusing on these two i have limited my discussion today on these two issues so just uh, for uh, those who are uh, new to this area uh, in political science we actually talk of political trust, it is an old concept and uh, it's very much related to democracy. It's basically in simple terms, it is defined as a reliability of a person or institution 
to deliver the ser uh, service it is supposed to deliver so uh, political trust may be defined as such as trust on political institutions and government and then mistrust would then be the expectation that the continuity of the services may be interrupted with nefarious consequences now this is also something that is go side by side with this emotion of political trust so we trust people we trust institutions because their services we consider as beneficial for us or would have beneficial consequences for our well being and we do not trust or we mistrust when we think that they may uh, endanger our well being they may bring us uh, certain uh, not so beneficial consequences now uh, looking at the uh, status of uh, the democracy there have been a multiple number of reports i have just uh, figured or i have just put in a few you can always go into uh, and find out some more now uh, what does it say about the world and india so if you look at the democracy report 2020 it is saying that the major g20 nations uh, which are a part of the third wave of autocratization india is among them and these uh, countries they are major economies with a good amount of population they have a uh, substantial global military economic and political influence and india uh, to be very specific it points out that it is on the verge of losing its status as a democracy due to a severe curtailment of scope for the media civil society and the opposition now this is a comment that is there in the status of democracy report 2020 now another report which is a global satisfaction with democracy 2020 another report which is published it's not so uh, drastic or it is not giving a, such a strong statement and it points out that uh, there india has fared consistently better it has, people are uh, satisfied with it although it points out that uh, not much data was available uh during the current period of protests and instability which uh, may prove to be a fresh dip of confidence in india's democratic process say uh, we had seen that there was a lot of protest regarding uh, abrogation of article 370 then the citizenship issue and uh, uh, these issues the way it was dealt with so uh, they have a doubt but anyway they have pointed out that uh, it's not so bad as we would see but okay it is uh, uh, in a better way now uh, why are indian satisfied then there are uh, uh, it points out that some scholars especially barrington more who says that there is a definitional political culture rooted in the caste system we could always discuss it as a separate area but anyway these are the points that they have pointed out in the report that colonial era socialization of democratic norms could be one and also the dominance of the congress party a dominance however that has recently come to an end and you see the emergence of another dominance another kind of dominance of another political party that is bjp and uh, it is uh, coming out in a big way or it is kind of the similar type of uh, kind of pattern and so you see that people are more or less uh, they are saying that they uh, people project that they are satisfied now another uh, report global findings democracy 2020 report it again uh, points out or again it gives a very negative picture of india it says that it has fallen to the level of defective democracies and the countries which are there india is one of them and that is basically they are pointing out due to growing political polarization and ethno nationalist mobilization that this could be the reason for this kind of uh, of uh, backsliding and uh, also uh, the report points out the growing sense among the citizens that uh, then economic and political elite is gradually emerging which has its own vested interest and it is using the government it is using the uh, people uh for its own interest and it is less accountable to the people because they are not accountable they are not elected but they are influencing the policies they are influencing the outcomes so uh, there is a, a kind of a feeling of um, uh, what would say that uh, uh, we're not much interested or rather democracy is declining and we cannot do much about it so uh, citizens are not very happy but then they have no way to go so they are uh, okay going on with it now another report global state of democracy 2019 which also uh, points out that there has been a widespread democratic erosion in the past 5 years especially uh, in the six third wave countries and this older democracy that is india 
and the reason it gives is that uh, because of this uh, moderate backsliding is that checks on government have decreased that more or less the institutions are the government is controlling most of the institutions and uh, the civil liberties have also decreased in the sense that the uh, civic space that we enjoyed earlier that is a uh, kind of um, uh, to a lot of it, to a great extent it is restricted and uh, there are a lot of uh, changes that has come about in legislative and regulatory frameworks and uh, uh, laws are there that regulate public protest and also online engagement that is we are kind of living in a panopticon we are always under if in that the restrictions on civil uh, civil space has taken in the form of um, arresting the people putting them behind us for uh, for raising their voice for raising issues which are uncomfortable for the uh, government or the regime and also there is a kind of a problem with media integrity that has been pointed out so they are focusing on these uh, three points that is there uh, the checks on government has reduced civil liberties have uh, very much been curtailed the space has shrunk and there is media integrity is of course questionable now amidst this so this bleak picture that we are getting <coughs> uh, we are finding uh, another interesting point and this is mood of the show on your screen you can see now this was done by india today and the carvi insights i think many of you have seen this has just come out and data uh, was collected was between july 15th and july 27th so it's very fresh and around 12021 interviews were conducted 67% in rural and 33% in urban areas and across 97 parliamentary constituencies and 190 now uh, of course there is a problem i think let me uh, say it i uh, to me they have not taken the northeastern states and they have not looked into that what they perceive or what is their perception about things so it is a kind of a very uh, there, there are some problems but anyway let's see what it has to say uh, uh, already uh, keeping in mind that it might not uh, give us the perfect picture uh, but they keep find the uh, errors but still what it is projecting so we find that 78% of those polled have rated the performance of his year means the prime minister's performance as good to outstanding that's very interesting and it also is interesting in the sense that uh, january 2020 when this had uh, been taken up the bjp tally had fallen and uh, but now it has uh, gone up and in fact Uh, the gap between uh, modi narendra modi and his rival that is rahul gandhi is uh, has widened so it is very less and regarding this atmanirbhar bharat campaign that was given 53% of those polled said that it was a timely campaign and 38% of them uh, feel that it india did not have the capability to become self reliant as yet uh, there is also a kind of a uh, division with regard to urban respondents and the rural respondents urban respondents consider handling of economy as dismal whereas the rural respondents consider unemployment was a bigger issue rather than the economy now regarding the handling of covid or this pandemic 48% felt india's response to this was at par with other countries in fact better than many of the world uh, democracies uh, in fact usa and 72% felt despite whatever problems they were suffering they had uh, they felt that the slogan given jaan hai to jahan hai was something relevant and they would expect or they would go with all the hardships because they believed in this that if there was life then there would be everything else so that is very interesting and it shows a kind of uh, trust or, or, or the or the people Uh, uh supporting it now another study that was made very recently that was the harvard business review this april and this study it was uh, conducted by four scholars they point out uh, they have actually uh, studied uh, the indian prime minister as one of the great leaders and they say that uh, certain behaviors help leaders to manage a big crisis again the leader the leader is uh, someone who is able to help or tie to the crisis and uh, the four points that they have pointed out was decide with speed over precision 
you are deciding with very high speed you are just if you look at our lockdown then you say that uh, earlier the our previous night they are saying that from tomorrow we have a curfew and we are having a curfew adapt boldly to the issues deliver reliably and engage for impact now these four things they point out in fact it's a huge study i did not uh, put it down because of the paucity of time uh, uh in fact in this study they have uh, point by point looked at and uh, pointed out that how the pr uh, prime minister has been able to actually deal with the crisis in a better way and that uh, is reflected even in the uh, mood of the nation survey now how do we look at it one of the arguments that i uh, was looking at or rather understood it as that uh, is in fact even during a uh, crisis in any family which is al always at loggerheads or people are at loggerheads you would find that uh, the people rally around and they come together whenever there is a crisis then the people kind of rally around they come together so this is uh, an interesting thing that can be seen uh, or one way of uh, explaining secondly if we look at the visualization attached to this corona as an enemy an enemy which is invisible and the imagery of the war where we are all warriors the health workers were warriors the frontline workers were warriors the leaders were warriors and we individuals were warriors by staying at home so uh, that kind of played into the imagination of the people that this was something that we were as a nation coming together solidarity uh, uh, is there and we are coming together to on a war which where we do not know who are our enemies we know that there is an enemy which is an invisible virus but then we are all uh, going to win over it other nations which are which were developed which were very uh, rich which were capable they could not with all their uh, infrastructure and support they could not but we were able to do it now uh, and the national leadership is looked at as an embodiment of national unity which is fighting against uh, the, the crisis for the public good which is especially significant when the leader is both head of the state and head of the government now this is also something uh, uh, that is an, another interesting point that is to be noted is that the opposition also reduces its attack politics it doesn't want to attack the government rather it wants to join hands and show solidarity with the regime even if they might be in opposition but you would find that they are uh, gradually coming together and trying to come together to perform better so that they are able to tie to the crisis so this uh, could be one of the reason that you do not see much of opposition or much of uh, negative comments made in this period now another interesting survey that came out very recently that is in august itself that is the csds survey which is uh, again on rural india and uh, this also uh, talks about something else or looks into something else what does it say but uh, it uh, it uh, conducted a, a kind of a um, uh, survey on 25300 respondents and you can see uh, the number of districts 179 districts and this was the uh, data that this was the uh, outcome of that report now 68% feel that they were they were in a monetary crisis 78% found work coming to a standstill 23% had to borrow uh, money to support their household 8% had to sell their valuable possession like their mobiles or uh, their bike or some uh, or their watch around one fourth of the people reported they had to walk back home 28% said that they were not paid for the work they had done in the city one found and uh, they they could find work but most could not find and 71% reported that they had a drop with their household income that they were becoming they had become poor now out of the 17% of the economically poor households who didn't have ration cards 27% said that they received wheat or rice from the government but rest did not now just see the emerge uh, the the gap that you would see that they did not receive anything they were in such a bad shape now 35% families went without food sometimes many times or the entire day and 38% skipped an entire meal 46% reduced a few items in their meal now that gives a very bleak picture of the situation now what holds for our future once the pandemic is over uh the question is are we going to find the same level of political trust or there would be a situation of something else now in fact if you look at the csds survey then uh 
although we saw that there were people who were in fact if you look at the gap people who did not get anything in fact if you remember the stories you would see that those who were uh, stranded in the cities where they were working many of them did not have any pds they did not have ration cards with them because their ration cards were in the villages so they could not uh, get food they could not afford uh, either uh, two square meals a day and in fact the situation was worse in urban india also if you look at the small time traders who neither could go and stand in a queue for uh, relief nor could they come out and say that we need food at the same time they didn't have job or they were uh, forced to stay back home because of lockdown now uh, however this csds survey points out that 74% felt the government handled it better two thirds of the returned workers did not mind the handling of the migrant crisis by the government and if you remember we could see images which are in fact very disturbing images of uh, children walking home uh, children as young as 2 year olds children who were forced to walk home and could not reach their homes so this kind of a violation of the rights of the individuals as if the uh, the question the state did not owe any accountability the, it was just i am uh, saying that it is a lockdown and it is a lockdown and you have to you have no way to go so i have no way no food nobody is bothered about me i am also a voter but nobody bothers or cares but then it is for your benefit that you have to stay at home so don't talk you are moving so this was something that we could see and urban india to uh, would not show a very different picture in fact i remember at my place uh, a guy committed suicide because he could not pay he had taken loan for running his household and the person the small finance company who actually they they paid the loan at a high rate of interest they started coming to his home and uh, it is alleged that one of once uh, this uh, one of the agent he came and said that if you die then you don't have to pay and that evening the boy or the guy Uh, committed suicide now that uh, came out we do not know what is the real thing but that comes uh, that came, that was a report in the newspaper in the local newspaper now these kind of crises are there but at the same time you are seeing or we have witnessed the participation of the people in the programs like thali baja or diya jalao i mean surprises when we didn't even know whether we would have a vaccine whether we would have how we would be managing the crisis if we happen uh, if it happens to us how do we deal with it nothing no that is this feel good things were very interesting points that uh, kind of as a pointer to our understanding or looking at the pandemic or how do we look at the pandemic or you know, the kind of trust we have in the government now uh, another interesting uh, minus or rather uh, missing thing that i have seen or we have, many of us have seen is debates on uh, public policies relating to health or education or employment and poverty related uh, issues they occupied very little media space we were not much discussing about that what is the, the look at the dismal structure uh, the condition of our health infrastructure or what do we do with education education which is actually exposing the digital divide some students are able to go for online education some are not just sitting at home some are trying to uh, uh, get two square meals a day and because they have to support their family so forget about education or anything else so uh, for me as a uh, social scientist what i find is that we are actually seeing the emergence of uh, multiple indias in the sense the generation which is able to access education through online uh, facilities they are developing technologically they are more advanced they are going to be more advanced and then you have a group of people who have forced to uh, look for employment because students are forced to look for employment because their fathers do not have income at home so they are doing something to support their families and so they cannot and moreover they do not have the facilities to go for education now in that kind of uh, situation uh, 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 it is a kind of it's a question mark on many uh, other uh, rights that we are uh, entitled to enjoy now these things are, are not occupying much of a space rather we see more important or uh, uh, certain other issues becoming more uh, focused or we are discussing them uh, more often in the sense of territorial security or nationalism that is occupying more space and it is driving our public opinion 
and uh, nationalism uh, we are not much into uh, this or that what is we are not looking into what is nationalism whether we are equating nationalism with majoritarianism whether we are looking at majoritarianism as nationalism or what is it uh, actually or are we um, uh, being driven or our imaginations are getting driven or our opinions getting driven by certain kinds of images that are being floated we are not much uh, uh, into it but rather yes we are talking about uh, our security our uh, uh, our pride and we are more concerned with this rather than discussing uh, that what is the government meant for the government what are the services we are supposed to get from the government and whether are we getting it or not now uh, to conclude rather i would keep it as an open area because uh, this is something uh, a picture that is very confused we are we do not know what we would see post pandemic as i started that it is a kind of an anxiety that is there i think there is anxiety in everybody's mind that what we, we would see now post pandemic are we going to uh, see a situation when there would be a blaming game that uh, they would start the center blaming the state or uh, the people blaming the governments or uh, what kind of a situation we would emerge and i think a uh, discussion can uh, come up that what we would see post pandemic whether the level of political trust that we are seeing that despite all odds people are having trust that okay this is the best or this uh, the government is best or the leadership is best they are doing the best for us so will it remain or there would be a change uh or there is an indication that the idea of democracy and fairness that democracy means also fairness is a rule of the people and it is a, a government for the people of the people that definition that we started with our our maybe our, our, our um, classes or when we started first or when, when we were introduced to the idea of democracy that has lost its appeal rather something else a kind of uh, a democracy where we do not equate it within this way but maybe we have come to have a different idea of a democracy uh, we are giving it the name of democracy because we don't have any other word for it so would it be that or it could be another interesting is a major engagement with issues of governance because if i look at the number of webinars and the seminars getting conducted and the number of people in, uh, uh, involving themselves in this so definitely there would be a kind of a murmur is definitely there i am not so uh, negative or i am not so uh, pessimistic in the sense that there would not be a uh, engagement major engagement with issues of governments some day or the other people would bring it up uh, in a a big way either uh, it's not just academics but even the common people would uh, bring up these issues of governance once the pandemic gets over or uh, it could also be the crystallization of the present political identity the way it's getting shaped because if you see there is pandemic at the same time parallel to the this uh, pandemic there are certain things happening as well which we are not uh, really looking at or there are certain undercurrents that are there which is also shaping our quality our kind of uh, identity that we would have in future or what kind of uh, uh, discourses we might have what kind of regime we might have what kind of uh, talks we might have or what kind of opinion formation we might have uh, or it can be uh, con of the freedoms lost and we, we would never regain them or we can uh, look up to the fact of uh, uh, a new india that is emerging which is uh simply different from the india that uh, we woke up when we got independence and maybe a, a different kind of india which is thinking differently the people are understanding things differently they have other issues which they consider as more important and uh, those issues may come up and they may actually capture our imagination so keep into uh, this i would uh, end my discussion here and uh, expect that the audience would also uh, rather engage in uh, discussion and debates even if it is not a very uh, loud debate at least it is a murmuring uh, discussion that uh, takes place on the issues and engaging in that what do we see with relation to uh, the condition or the state of state of democracy in india and the state of political trust in india thank you Hello. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, this was a beautiful analysis, analytical talk, of course, and um, 
I must say that Professor Vandita Chakorty has rightly raised so many questions and has uh, collated uh, so many issues which have been bothering us uh, for the last almost 200 days that India has directly been hit with this pandemic virus. And naturally, there are enough scopes and enough issues and enough, 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 enough you know, ideas to rethink over, to relocate and to redefine uh, definitely in terms of democracy, in terms of governance, in terms of this political trust and etc. etc. I'm sure that lot, lots of questions will be flooding in. So I will ask everybody to be ready with the questions and we'll definitely go whatever be the uh, truncated time and that we are going to have after this lecture, after the lecture of University. We will definitely try all the others to accommodate all these questions. If at all, one or two questions uh, you know, are being answered by our, uh, at least if they get this time to answer those questions, that will naturally be, will give us enough opportunity to engage with them even in a better way after, after the session, after the lecture. Now, uh, this is uh, Professor Shudit Chakraborty now who will be delivering our second lecture, a special lecture. Professor Chakravarti has uh, long been acquainted with uh, these kinds and long been working on uh, some chronic issues of our democracy, of our quality, of our society as such, in, in terms of child abuse, child trafficking, and different other economic crisis issues also. Now, he is at present delivering a lecture with a title of COVID-19 hit Indian economy and the way forward. The other day, I was listening to a lecture of Jean Dreje, that uh, famous economist. I'm not a person of economics, but he, I saw that he was uh, relating two terms of medical science into this scenario of this recent economic debacle or whatever it is in the, uh, of Indian, 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 uh, of the Indian democracy, of course, Indian, Indian society. Uh, this pandemic hit Indian society. Uh, he was he was using the term chronic, and also the acute, and he was telling that economics, some economics and some economists always are bothered with some chronic problem, and some economists they are uh, much more easy to deal with some acute problems. I am sure that Professor Shubhendra will be bridging up the gap between the chronic and the acute problems of economics in terms of this pandemic hit India and will naturally give us an exhilarating lecture. Thank you very much for listening to Professor Vandita Chakravarti with such a good patience. All the audience, we are now over to Professor Shudit Chakravarti. Shudita, please. Shudita, it's your turn. Sir, please unmute yourself. Shudita, please unmute Sir, the I... mic. Please unmute the mic, Shudita. We cannot uh, listen to you. The mute is, uh, the mic is already in, uh, still in a mic, mute mode. Shudita, mic ta on koro. Shudita, the mic, mic is still in the mute mode. Yeah, uh, please unmute it. We can see you, definitely, but the mic is still in the mute mode. Please unmute it. Uh, I think there is a temporary glitch with the connection of Dr. Shudip Chakravarti, but he will definitely be coming back within seconds. Please bear with us.
yes yes come live shudhu the mic ta ke on korte hobe on mute korte hobe set theke Is that please unmute the mic? Yeah, yeah, of course. No, it's okay. Okay, now it's okay. It's absolutely okay, fine. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for <laughs> taking your time because I'm not so comfortable with this uh, technology. Is it okay? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sir. It's yes. okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sir. You know. Uh, thank you, Rajdeep Tor, and uh, uh, thank Managuri College. uh thank papia and others for organizing this and uh, i am thankful to all of you for inviting me uh today today i am uh, uh, going to discuss on a very crucial issue because people everywhere are all concerned about the prospect about the future of india not only of india but everywhere Uh, there has been this corona virus has affected the economic activities what will happen to the the employment to the future and how the economy will run if the vaccine is not yet been discovered how the people will come out and join the economic activities and how the economy will again come back to the normal track so this is the concern of each and every one on this planet i would say it is not only usa the italy england to brazil to argentina to india and bangladesh to pakistan everywhere people are concerned and now let me focus on india how this covid 19 will affect all already affected india and what is there in the future let me begin with the with this reality that even before the outbreak of covid indian economy was not at all in good shape we study the health of the economy by the measure of the gdp growth rate grossly speaking so gdp for india just before the covid outbreak was 11 years lowest it was only 4.2% that is very alarming this is before the outbreak of the covid and this uh, growth rate if you compare with the previous years growth rate uh, particularly from uh, 2002 to 2012 india was doing well and the growth rate of indian economy was around 8 to 9% but unfortunately over the last few years growth rate has come down and as per the uh, national account statistics it is just 4.2% before the lockdown this is one aspect there are other aspects also regarding the health of the indian economy one is our employment data because if uh, whether the economy is running well is reflected uh, on the number of job creation if the growth does not create jobs for the unemployed that growth is meaningless take the case of india at the moment just before the covid um, uh, breakout uh, outbreak uh, that uh, the the it was uh, the nsso national sample survey organization 
uh, which publishes this employment unemployment data they have published before the, this outbreak that uh, india's uh, unemployment was highest you last 45 years highest at 6% which is also alarming and uh, alongside this national sample survey organization there is another authority which is called uh, periodic labor force survey they have surveyed that uh, according to their estimate uh, unemployment is growing which means employment is coming down and it is around 6.2% so this is a very horrible picture just before the outbreak the outbreak is hitting of course but just before the outbreak situation was not satisfactory thirdly let us look at the inequality which is very important what is the inequality uh, inequality just simply means uh, you know how the growth fruits the fruits of economic growth Uh, is shared among the people of india if india is rising is growing the fruits of this growth must be shared equally among the people of india but what is happening in india it is not only in india we find it the same in china in the, um, uh, you know post reform uh, russia in brazil everywhere we find that reforms has resulted in a deepening inequality of income and wealth take the case of india before the covid outbreak uh, if you go by the statistics you know almost 10% of the rich people of india they have acquired 70% of our national wealth so this is a very horrible sign a very uh, depressing sign because if the growth even before the outbreak i'm speaking about the outbreak before the outbreak if the inequality uh, the distribution of wealth and income is so horrible and where millions and millions of people in india are not getting the fruits of economic growth and this will certainly not well uh, and it's a very dangerous sign so we have to think in the future how to reduce the inequality and the distribution can be so evenly thirdly if i uh, discuss about the number of billionaires in india that is up to we have to consider this also what is happening take the example of uh, the year during 1991 1992 1993 there was not even a single indian who could make in the list of the billionaires in the forbes magazine uh, as we all know that forbes magazine they publishes list of billionaires worldwide in dollar terms of course in 91 in the 90s there was none but today before the breakdown we can find that more than 100 indians are making a billionaire and uh, the forbes list the top 10 among the top 10 billionaire richest person in the world you will find three to four indians who have made it so this is also a sign of deepening and widening inequality of income and wealth so this is also a very bad sign just before the outbreak so let us look at our agriculture sector before the outbreak so i am talking about the what happened what was the state of economy just before the covid outbreak and how all the sectors are been affected by the covid outbreak or you can say the lockdown mess take the example of agriculture sector the rural sector specifically where you say we live in such a country india where almost 65 to 70% people they live in rural areas and their major source of livelihood is agriculture and dairy and allied activities what we have been uh, witnessing during last 10 years in the agriculture first we hear of the farmer suicide the taking place just take the example of year 2018 
which is a very latest estimate. In 2018, 10,345 people, farmers, committed suicide. And why did they commit suicide? And the reasons are widely known. One is, you can say, the indebtedness, the crop failure. They went to the private money lenders, the interest rate high, they couldn't afford. It's a crop failure, they put a date the genuine price of the produce. There may be pest attack, there may be natural calamities. So many reasons are there for which farmers were pushed to the wall. They did not find any other things for survival. So, so they took to farmers. So farmer suicide is a, is a horrible sign of India's agrarian sector. And the most alarmingly, what we have been witnessing after the, the lockdown was announced in India, anyone watching the TV will uh, found that there are there are uh, millions and millions of rural workers who are working in the urban uh, construction sector. They were returning home. They walked thousands of miles uh, without food, without water. Uh, they all came from the rural areas, agrarian areas, the agrarian India. And why did they come back? Because, because uh, uh, they, were, they were trapped in such a situation that they are bound to come back in their homes. And why did they go there? Because their village, their village could not provide job opportunities for their youth. Agricultural sector in India is stagnant for the last two decades. If agricultural sector is stagnant, if we could not grow, the surplus workers of our rural youth that migrated to the urban centers, city centers uh, in search of bread. And that has happened. And the whole world is witnessing, already witnessed in the TV screen, the, the horrible plight of, the, of these workers who had left their homes for years just to uh, eke out their living. So this is the sign of our uh, depressing agricultural sector. And now, International Monetary Fund, as well as many other rating agencies, they are predicting that Indian economy will, will shrink uh, by 4% uh, uh, to 5%. And uh, there are other rating agencies who are having a horrible picture of Indian economy, will like take shape next year or. So, and what will happen? If the GDP, instead of growing, if the GDP contracts, on what is the real effect of it? The real effect is quite clear. The real effect of the GDP contraction, as predicted by the International Monetary Fund, as well as by the World Bank and other international rating agencies, the prediction of GDP contraction and it is not happening only in India. It is happening everywhere. We are not uh, the country uh, is, uh, as, as a special case of, the, of the getting the heat of the uh, COVID-19. Whole world is more or less affected and GDP is shrinking everywhere. But GDP shrinking in Italy or USA or England is different from what is happening in our country. Because in our country, Poverty is already was very high, and the government at the moment is, uh, you know, uh, prioritizing is uh, public investment on the, the treatment of the COVID patients, uh, spending on ventilators and uh, spending on beds and spending on PPEs so that people's lives could be saved. So this is a very crucial moment that government in almost all the countries, India also, is now prioritizing its investment on the healthcare at the moment. 
although these are all inadequate, still we are hoping government is spending on that. And the question is, if the, if the prediction is right, that Indian economy will shrink, GDP will contract by 4%, then what will happen? I am sorry to say that it will happen on two sides that there will be there will be layoffs. The companies, the employers who has employed uh, their people, most of them will lose their jobs. In, if you look at all the sectors in Indian economy, if you look at the service sectors, the hotel, the transport, entertainment industry, all industry everywhere barring a very few exceptional industries where people are allowed to work from home, almost all service sector industries in deep trouble. Hotel, the restaurant, where India's millions of workers are involved. The hotel industry, entertainment industry, tourism industry, there are lines of such industries which are badly affected everywhere and in our country also. So what will happen? The first, there will be job loss and there will be income loss. The job and income will be lost. If the GDP or the economy shrink, and interestingly, in our country, which is very diverse, not so homogeneous like the Western economies. Our, our Indian economy is very vast. India is very diversified, very vast, with more than 1.4 billion people. Our issue is a little bit different from many other developing countries in South. Take, for example, if there is a shrinkage in the GDP, or there is a hit in the, our economy, uh, the non-farm sector and the farm sector, as on today, the non-farm sector contributes to 70% of our gross value added. I mean, it's a 70% contribution is happening in some states. For example, take the example of Delhi. If Delhi is as a state, its uh, economic configuration we see that 76, 80 percent of the people are involved in non-forum activities, in transport, in hotel, uh, in several service sectors, in government jobs, in private jobs, in transport, all kind of non-forum, non-agricultural activities. And if uh, the shrinkage happens, the non-forum sector will be severely hit. The farm sector and the government sector may not be hit as the other sectors will. So Delhi hit will be the economic pain, I would say. The economic pain in Delhi will be much higher than what we find in Madhya Pradesh, uh, where um, you can say uh, the, the contribution of the non-farm sector is almost 56%. So the economic pain will be a bit less in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, if we go to Arunachal Pradesh, uh, the non-farm sector uh, contributes uh, only to 35%. So in Arunachal Pradesh, the hit on the non-farm sector will be least. So what I would uh, say that India is a diverse country. So its diversity is so many states and so many diversity is there. So the impact of the shrinkage of the, our uh, national uh, economy will be not uniform across geographies. Secondly, there are some sectors in Indian economy which is a bit uh, uh, labor intensive. And there are so many other sectors in the economy which are, you can say, technology intensive or, or labor intensive or, or is not not labor intensive, capital intensive. Take the example, even in the non-farm sector, if you take the example of the construction sector in the urban areas, India's urban areas, as construction sector is a very vibrating sector, 
sorry, the, the heat or the shrinkage of our economy, the contraction in the GDP uh, will affect the construction sector as well as the financial sector, in the financial sector. But the job loss in the construction sector will be much, much higher than the job loss in the finance sector because finance sector they, they involves less labor and more IT technology. So which sector will be affected, where, which sector employment will come down depending on the nature of the sector, whether the sector is uh, labor intensive or IT, capital, automation, uh, uh, intelligence, uh, in, 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 intelligence intensive industries. Now the interesting question faced by almost all right thinking person that how this uh, this the COVID nineteen has affected our, our our economy and others economy also. First, when it was. Uh, uh, spotted, detected that this virus is contagious and infectious, the government uh, was really in, in indulgence, was thinking uh, what to do right at the moment. Should uh, the economic activity should be stopped or uh, the, the, there should be a lockdown so that people uh, cannot go out of home. Uh, so that if the people uh, could stay home, uh, stay safe, this kind of policies, if this kind of policy of the lockdown is being imposed, what is the effect? The effect is the economic activities in all sectors, service sector, industry sector, manufacturing, all sector activities will come to a stand still. So government everywhere was in confusion. What should you look for the health of the economy? Or should you look at the health of the people? If you if you prioritize health of the people, then lockdown is must. Or if you see the economy has to run, people should not uh, lose their job. Then there should have any lockdown. So these two kind of options were very confusing for almost all the governments. So they went to the WHO, World Health Organization. The, and all this organization uh, predicted that the, this the virus is contagious and people's it is virus is spreading from people's, people's contract. So government should immediately announce lockdown. So the lockdown, the lockdown effect is on the economy is two-sided. One-sided is the stop of production that is affecting the supply side. You will not uh, get uh, the market. You will not get the, the commodity which you get in the market. For example, uh, we export, we import many intermediate goods from China. For example, we, we, we uh, import many intermediate goods from China. Say, for example, we make uh, a, a mobile set here in India. But all these intermediate products, the circuit, to everything coming from China. Now, if the export or import is stopped because of the lockdown, the production will be stopped. Then the market will find the scarcity of goods and services. This is one part of the horrible story. The other part is more important. That is the, the sharp fall in the consumption demand. When a large number of people in the country like ours 70%, 80% of people are dependent on informal sector. Uh, when um, these sectors have no job security, they can't do uh, any work, work from home on a digital mode. So lockdown after lockdown, they are losing their jobs. When they are losing their jobs, their income has come down. So when they have no money to spend, there will be a horrible picture in the market because in the market, market will run, the economy will run on two pillars. One is the supply side on, on the left hand side and the demand side on the right hand side. So two sides are hit by this lockdown. 
now the question is how long uh, this uh, this problem will persist how long our informal sectors in agriculture in the informal sector industries in all kind of uh, activity economic activities where millions and millions of indians indians were employed they finally they they you know the layoffs in many sectors because it was unsustainable for many small shop owners to, to continue the employment with their employees so they have they have shut down so they lost their jobs and when they lost their jobs they have lost their income they don't have money in their pocket so then they don't buy commodities so what is happening is the door on both sides now the question is uh, the how long this dismal picture will persist uh, uh it all depends of course it is not in our hands it not in our hands at the moment because uh, we have not yet found any any just the proper vaccine so if vaccine is right vaccine is comes after so many uh, phases of trial and when uh, world health organization permits is to use for human for human use then only we can be sure that uh, the, the 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 this uh, virus infection can be stopped unless that is been guaranteed uh, at the international level at the, at the country level is very very crucial moment and issue is very important uh, that unless the vaccine is made, comes comes in the market or you can access the vaccine and so that people can have trust the workers all economic activity participants who are who are the people who will bring back our economy to the normal to that uh, pre pandemic uh, stage It all depends on our workers who will take part in this vast range of economic activities and when the vast of activities will run they will have income and they will have spend and market will shoot up and the economy will back to its healthy state but at the moment the whole world is really confused and more than more than 100 countries are you know trying with the this on the vaccine but uh, as at the moment uh, nothing concrete has been come out so so the question is what the government should do at the moment unless the vaccine comes it may take two years it may take one years and the vaccine comes what will do will the economy slide down in such a way that will free fall like this happening here in india the best solution best affordable solution what is 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 a, you know if you get a solution there are short term uh, some short term solutions some medium term some long term the, at the moment the short term solution is to, to to give cash to the rural masses so they are without money they don't have purchasing capacity the mass of the people in the rural areas of the india who work in the informal sector who have been jobless and the reverse migration workers who have come back from the cities back to their home they are jobless and many of them are not uh, i am i many of them are uh, in search of jobs but they have to be given some cash or the one is mandrega the mandrega works should be universal now should be spread across the india's uh, length and breadth for the rural masses who can get at the wage income and they can spend their money and that to we economy can be sustain for the time being otherwise there is a risk that already in india we have seen the wealth is cornered by a uh, by a simple section by uh, by, a, by the super rich by the rich and the majority of population in india are facing severe crisis in terms of low income and low demand so uh, at the moment as a, as a short term measure it is not urgent need of the government to think that uh, the 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 people should have the cash and that can be uh, uh, can be can be executed to to direct cash transfer uh, to their bank account 
or to, to the expansion of the Manrega work so that they can earn the wage income. And as they have got the income, they can spend in, in the real market and the market will sustain. And by this way, this is a short term measure. And for long term measure and, and uh, medium term measure, I hope that Indian economy, like many economy, will come back. And there are, there are some uh, indication that there are two types of recoveries we have, we can have. One is V-shaped and other is U-shaped. Uh, if we can be, if, if the vaccine comes, if we can, uh, if all the, almost all the people can get access to the vaccine, uh, with the next year, we can turn in a V-shape, which means that in the beginning, the economy will come down, come down, come down, come down to the lowest point. And after that, there will be sharp turn and sharp jump and sharp rise. So this is V-shaped recovery we expect. And if it's not the sharp recovery, we can have the U-shaped -U recovery, which means that economy is not going down. It will down, go down to a certain point. Then after that, oh, the economy will rise. So an economy will come back to normal shape. And uh, what I would say, I am hopeful that the, all the governments are trying their best to contain the spread at the, at the domestic level. And uh, at the same time, uh, there is a good sign that uh, there is international cooperation in almost all the countries uh, regarding the, the, this uh, vaccine discovery. And I think uh, the USA, uh, which is not cooperating with China at the moment, is not the right thing at the moment because uh, the world is in great trouble. USA as a technology power, as a scientific power, should cooperate with the WHO, World Health Organization, even should cooperate with China on such a humanitarian issue. They may have other political issues or business issues, but at the moment the whole world is in crisis. We must share our knowledge and sharing our knowledge, sharing our technology, to fight this global pandemic can only pave the way for a bright future of the humanity. So this is a challenge to us for our world leaders to come to a same platform for forgetting all political differences, ideological differences, business interest differences, and cooperate in inventing or discovering a way out so that humanity at the moment can come out of the deep crisis and see the new new light, the new sun in the horizon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shrita Uh That was brilliant. And that was naturally, uh, and quite predictably so. It was also touching on the acute problem and the chronic problem. And it was really building up that very well because in this pandemic hit situation, we cannot afford to uh, ignore the state in which we were just before the pandemic. And we cannot ignore to compare that with this particular situation that we are in now, when we are being hit by the pandemic. Because this comparison will naturally enable us to understand and relocate our situation, our location in this a uh, new kind of a world where we are really struggling to survive with all kinds of calamities, crises in several respects and respects. Thank you, Shurita, and thank you very much. Okay. Now, I'm um, uh, really afraid uh, that our time constraint is something which is causing us to have a very big and energized session of interaction. We have to somehow uh, keep it a little brief because we are running short of time. Uh, if there is any question, I can take at least, we can take at least one or two questions. But the questions, uh, this is my honest request to everybody, whoever is listening, ardently to these two very beautiful discussions of Professor Ranjita Chakraborty and Professor Shudhi Chakraborty. Please keep your questions, whoever is intent on questioning, uh, put on a question. Uh, uh, just please keep your questions uh, within a very short and frame it within one or two sentences because if the questions take a lot of time then the will naturally 
not receive that much of concentration from us. They will not be able to give a proper answer as time is very short for us for this interview. Is there any questions? If it's not working, we can take at least two questions. So the questions are there in the chat box. If you could select them and then you from the speakers, them, I think it will be better because we've got too many questions. So the discussion is entirely yours to pick the questions of your choice. Yep. Uh, that, that, that is a good thing from the, the organizer's part because uh, it's me uh, to, 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 to curtail the risk of being flooded by so many questions. I have already received one question out there and these questions I'm putting to both of our speakers, you can answer it. Uh, first to Professor Ranjita, Ranjita Chakraborty and then to Professor Shudip Chakraborty. The question is that excessive uh, centralization, this is an observation, of course, and the question is based on this uh, observation, that excessive centralization or the increased uh, interference of the central government into the autonomy of the state has truncated the role of the state. There is, of course, the recent situation in India. Now the question is, where does that leave us? Leave the local self-government institutions in the perspective yes. of this pandemic. Please, mm. Professor Rundi, let's talk about it. Yes, uh, uh, kind of local self-governments. Uh, in fact, the situation was not very good either. Uh, one has to reflect on the political culture that uh, we have had in the past in the sense that if you would uh, observe that um, in the earlier days also the way the center behaved with the state the state too behaved in a similar manner with the local governments so uh, it is not something very new or something very strange that is happening today and that we are suddenly waking up to the fact but one thing has come out very open and clear that if the local self governments are not uh, given adequate uh, space to function well, it would be very difficult to control any kind of a crisis that we'd see because uh, centralizing everything or uh, taking control from a one particular point would not uh, uh, be able to do justice or it would not um, be proper on the part of uh, neither the state nor the center to do justice to the grassroots. So grassroots needs um, a lot of space, and that is something that, I, as I was pointing out, that a lot of issues need to be debated upon, rather than we are uh, concentrating on our, uh, the, usually we talk about our territorial security, the border, but then uh, it's not about just uh, territorial security uh, managing our life, right to life. Right to life is also uh, uh, something very key. Uh, with regard to, as uh, uh, Professor Chakraborty uh, last uh, in his speech was pointing out, the human security, the human security is a major issue. And here, uh, if uh, the local self governments are not given enough space, I, uh, it, it would be difficult for any any government to manage the crisis. Really. So uh, in this kind of situation, this understanding that too much centralization would probably solve the purpose is would be a misnomer or would be a wrong kind of an understanding, wrong kind of an approach. Because we have seen that those regions which have had a vibrant local self government, they have been able to deal with better. In fact, if you look at the example of Kerala, for ex uh, this state has one uh, done wonderful well. Of course, you can say that uh, the uh, the Kerala could do it well because of uh, different other that uh, its health infrastructure was during the other crisis that it experienced, and it was able to manage this crisis well because of that. But even then, I would uh, say that yes, uh, in this uh, we are also centralizing this. It is not something that you uh, rather. Uh, this pandemic also gives us a space to debate on it and point out that whether we should take it uh, this way or we would rather go for something where we are uh, giving more space to uh, the uh, levels below. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Chakravarti. Uh, I think uh, this question was naturally on behalf of everybody. So I think you have uh, already uh, uh, satisfied with the answer provided by Professor Chakraborty. Professor Shudip Chakraborty. So, Shudip, the same question so, uh, uh -huh. also is geared to you, please. 
ഓർഗനൈസേഷൻസ് constitutional agencies uh, which you find in recent times in india to take a hold of the, uh, the the neutral constitutional agency under the, their own control and bypassing the states the bypassing the federal structure the federal structure is the essence of the the our, our constitution and what our founding fathers of the great nation they had dreamed of india as a, as a federation of states is a federal states the federal structure and if all the states are strengthened then only india can uh, can be strong so that idea is now uh, it being being uh, being posed to a serious challenge as you see now because there is a tendency of the, the of the central uh, you know domination uh, at the cost of the states uh, without looking into the opinion of the states taking all the states in consideration these are not happening you know unfortunately this is not this is going against the spirit of the constitution as i understand it thank you thank you shubhita now i am sure uh, that in the discussions and the answers uh, both these things are being kept so open and the chance of full of possibilities by both the eminent speakers in that a lot of us uh, a lot of listeners also are uh, feeling this inclined to engage with them with a uh, uh, more scope and with more questions but as i already told you that i mean we are running short of time so therefore we have to put an end or uh, bring an end to this station to this beautiful station thank you very much professor ranjit ji thank you both for being with us and for enlightening us with such a beautiful uh, uh, discussion and thank you also professor shudip chakraborty now this is over to, uh the valedictory station uh, for this station of course the vote of thanks will be given by professor dr Dibbentu Dashkup, Assistant Professor and Head of the Department of Political Science of the Department of Political Science, Mr. Dimakarani, Malpal, Kalpani, Kalpani. This is over to Professor Dibbentu Dashkup. Please, sir. Please, sir. Proceed with your report. Thank you, Dr. Rai. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all. First of all, I am honored to be a part of this webinar as you know that this two day international webinar organized by monagiri college in collaboration with kodimal mitra city mahavidyalay malbazar jalpaiguri on the topic pandemic reality emerging issues and perspectives today that is uh, 18th august 2020 tuesday is the second and last day of this webinar and we have just completed our special lecture session ladies and gentlemen it gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this session to all dignitaries attending here first of all i would like to thank dr rajadeep toroy associate professor department of english monagiri college for delivering his opening remarks on this topic and at the same time uh played the role as a counselor of the program my sincere thanks goes to our beloved head department of political science north bengal university professor dr ronjit chakraborty for sharing with us a special lecture on pandemic and political stress which is based on indian context 
I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Dr. Shubhi Chakraborty, Associate Professor and Head, Department of Economics, Anand Chandra College, Jalpaiguri, for his presentation that how COVID-19 hit Indian economy and what should be the way out. Finally, the wonderful participants who have turned up in a such great numbers from different parts of India as well as world. Thank you so much for your kind cooperation. Thank you, everybody. Over to Dr. Rai. Thank you, Professor Dipendu Dashgupta. Now, uh, Priyadar Shri, please take over the thing and Prahat, so you'll be say, proceeding towards our next session. Uh, thank you, uh, all the participants and listeners who are probably listening to this and beautiful session, the primary session of our second day of this webinar. Thank you very much. Priyadar Shri. Uh, thank you, Rajdeep Sura. Uh, we've come to the uh, end of the morning session of special lectures. So, we will start our parallel technical sessions immediately. I would request all the participants to carefully note the links given to you via mail and the Telegram group and join your technical sessions where you are listed as a speaker. So I'll end this session now and I would request all of you to uh, the participants who are not presenters can join any session of their choice, but the paper presenters are requested to join their respective sessions. I would uh, like to ask uh, Professor Ronjita Chakraborty, Chakraborty, Madam, to um, Join us as the chair for the technical session one. Uh, I have already given you the link by email. So, madam, uh, please click on the email and join that session. And thank you for the rest of the participants. It was a wonderful session. Thank you.
हेलो डॉक्टर रीता द्विवेदी 